Hello, everybody. Welcome to a check-in with the Bookening. It's been a little bit since we did an episode, but we've got another one coming, and various life things have bumped it a little bit, but it's still coming, right, guys? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, we're talking mm-hmm. Proust, which he wrote what a lot of people say is the great novel. I was going to say the great American novel, but obviously it's not the great American novel. I think we can definitively say that In Search of Lost Time is not the great American novel, but I think so, yeah. He wrote the great <laughs> he wrote the great novel of the 20th century perhaps, the great certainly the precursor for all the weird modernist stuff that happened. And it's much more accessible than, let's say, Joyce's Ulysses or something like that, as far as these sorts of indeed, yeah, insurmountable obstacle snob things go. I'm not going to say it does want you to slow down. It does, which is and take your time with it. Right. Right. And we're not even committing to do all 3000 pages. We're just doing the first chunk of the first volume, Swan's Way. But I think we were going to do it two weeks ago and it was just like, yeah, we could try and rush through this one. The guys could download the audio book and try and listen to it on three times speed. But that's just, you might as well not do Proust if you're going to do Proust that way. Like if maybe, maybe some of our listeners will be like, just don't do Proust. Just do more Harry Potter or Narnia. But uh, sounded like Alan Arkin there a little bit. But if you're going to do Proust, you might as well actually mm-hmm. do Proust. So yep, it's coming. It'll be out in a couple of weeks. Would you, if like our patrons have received this book and they're like, I don't know if I want to read Proust, would you guys say they should or shouldn't? Or I've loved it. And it is just one of those books that as you read it, man, I've spent so much, not to spoil the, what we're going to say, but I've spent so much time. But part of what really good literature does is it just makes you think. Right. and And so in terms of... Thinking, like I, I've had so many childhood memories. I've had so many Proustian moments of reading Proust mm-hmm. where I've just thought and rethought and recontextualized certain aspects of my childhood. And it's been really fun and really sweet and really kind of melancholy at times because of how much it forces you to just reckon with change and everything disappearing and how much or how little we carry and pass on of what's come before us we have our lives and they're over soon and we take things to our graves that will be forgotten forever except by god and you know if you if you're the kind of person who gets high on existential vibes like that and also just like man tapping into some of those really elemental childhood feelings of mom and loneliness and shadows and darkness and magical places that were just ordinary places but felt magical mm-hmm. all that sort of thing i mean it's like the it's first 50 it. pages or 100 pages that's just him laying in bed plotting to get his mother to come mm-hmm. and give him another good night kiss or something like another that. hug right yeah another kiss yeah in every it's so it's like very specific to him but it's such a universal feeling of longing Mm -hmm. for the nearness and affection of your mother and the pain of it. And so it was just so much like that, that he does such a good job with that it's really worth, like there have been books that we have read that have wanted to be read more slowly. And we've just said, well, we've got a job to do, so we have to get it done. And this is just one of those books where it's like, okay, we've got a job to do, but so what? We're reading Proust. And so let's read Proust the way Proust should be read. That is our job. And darn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that it was, it's been good for us to give ourselves the permission on this one to take the time that it takes. Yeah. And I think it'll a, pay off in our discussion too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, not to spoil my take, but yeah. Well, maybe I should save this. But the book that it actually weirdly reminds me of quite a bit is Augustine's Confessions. I mean, it's completely pagan, but just in terms of a guy being like, I am going to take a magnifying glass to my own soul, to my own train of thoughts, to the berries that I picked when I was four years old or whatever, and I am just going to treat all of it with the importance of the universe hanging in the balance. And not many people are 
good enough writers to pull that kind of thing off. But uh, Augustine and Proust are both pretty good at it. Yeah, I actually think it's such a worthwhile endeavor because the universe does hang in the balance in those moments. Your universe does. And so much of our lives are shaped by these really simple elemental moments of childhood. And then we get set or twisted or confirmed or whatever. It goes to shape who we are and how we relate to people and our relationships and everything downstream. And so it is the universe. And it's sort of like that thing. What's the Dunn poem? Don't ask for him the bell tolls. It tolls for you. You know, I said in a, a sermon not long ago, <clears throat> mothers and fathers and grandparents die every day. But when your dad dies, it will be the first time in the history of the world and the only time that your dad died. And you'll experience it that way. And it's not narcissistic to think that way about it. It's part of the tragedy and awfulness of sin and the way that we deal with these things. And so every kid goes through these sorts of things. But so it's universal and common that for each kid, every first is still the first in the history of the world. Just like every last is every last in the history of the world. And so it is. The, the universe does hang in the balance. It is a big thing. And treating it that way is really cool and really important, I think. Not that we sort of like sentimentalize childhood or turn it into something it's not, but that we recognize all these things that form us and shape us and that form and shape our own kids. Things that we can tend to, even though we can remember or forget how big it was for us, then we downplay it for our own kids because uh, it's common and we've been through it ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty powerful book and very dense with ideas and reflections. And just, I mean, some of what Proust does is he's thinking about the nature of like consciousness and memory and dream and perception and personality and people. But I don't know. It's also like it has a weird effect of feeling as he goes into all this extreme detail about moments of his childhood of feeling like you're witnessing some alien world so it has it just has a, it has an effect of making you both like jake said remember your own your own childhood and how little things were like giant things to you and you can you might go back into your own memory or consciousness and access them as giant things but then also <laughs> they're weird yeah who are, who are these decadent the, french I, who yeah who are these people? Like, what is this alien world? Like, why do they talk and act this way? And then I think you can kind of actually turn and do that to your own experience. Like, man, life is weird. Like, my life has been weird. I've met some weird people. I'm weird. I've had some strange experiences. And it, I don't know. It's, it is strange to think that we all have worlds inside us. Like Walt Whitman said, <laughs> I contain multitudes. And that you can, you realize following proofs that, you could, although not having the literary skill or perhaps as good a memory as Proust, you could do the same thing he does. You, you've, you have the same sort of immersive worlds inside of you that he was carrying around in his 30s or whenever he wrote these books. So it's not every author that actually changes your perception. I mean, uh -huh. I think some of the greatest, even like a Jane Austen, you read a Jane Austen novel and suddenly you go to church the next Sunday and you're like, well, this person is this stereotype and this person is this stereotype and I don't like this person because of this and I do like this, but you're suddenly judging uh -huh. people through her moral categories. She's given you that for better or worse, usually for better. And Proust is the same way in that you are suddenly looking at your life, borrowing something from his way of looking at his life. And uh, I think the truly greats, the people whose books we love to just live in, a Tolstoy or something like that, are that way. And then most authors aren't. Most authors aren't actually lending you an entire pair of spectacles that you can then uh -huh. look at the world through your, for the rest of your life. Yeah, at the very best, they have a poetic turn of phrase that makes you look at something differently oh, or again, for the first time. Right? Yeah. At the, at the best. But this, is a, this is a lens, a filter for your life. Yeah, definitely. And it, as, as we said before to each other a couple of times, 
hey, this reminds me of Gene Wolf, modern sci-fi author who died a few years ago, who is definitely downstream of Proust. And I would say it's a similar effect for me of Gene Wolf, who's a weird and also very decadent sort of author, although nominally a Christian, maybe a real Christian, I don't know. He, in, in a similar way as Proust, sort of with his own twist or tweak, and I'm not saying Wolf is the same level of literary genius as Proust or something, but he gave me a different perspective on the world this way. But it's, it, anyway, that guy's not doing the same thing as Proust, but he's downstream of Proust. He's borrowing some of that. Here's my perception. Here's how alien and strange the world can look. Here's what it's like to really be in someone else's shoes in a completely different culture or context in a way that you never considered before. It's outside of your experience. And also, you can turn it the lens back on your own life and think of the people around you and stuff in a way that you didn't before. Yeah, I mean, I've constantly thought about sci-fi authors as we've read through this and fantasy authors because I'm mm-hmm. just like the best of them. Even like a Tolkien. It's like Tolkien yeah. recontextualizes trees and skies and things for you such that they have magic mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. And Proust is doing yeah. a similar thing with childhood, with cookies and tea, with right. mommy. Flowers. With, with flowers. Lots uh, of flowers. With, with little desserts that you had as a kid that you forgot about. Right. And certainly in later volumes with the sex and sexuality and young love and all that stuff. So you got to be careful right. with Proust and homosexuality also. But the, so it's this isn't the unequivocal recommendation. But gosh, we started talking about it and we can't. I guess this is just a nice little appetizer for the episode yeah. that you'll get. And maybe an, a, an advertisement to actually give it a shot. If you read the first of his 9,000 word labyrinth sentences and just got turned off. <laughs> Maybe follow those sentences through a couple of their sinews and see if you can get somewhere because he's good. Okay. Goodbye, listeners. We'll be back with Swan's Way. Goodbye. Goodbye.